Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Myself, Zakaria Ahmed, field assistant biotech hub Bahana College. I am your moderator. It's my pleasure to welcome all you here to the DBD funded hands on training program on bioinformatics organized by DBD funded institutional biotech hub Bahana College, Jurhat. Uh, this lecture program will be inaugurated by our honorable uh, principal of Bahana College. Uh, Dr. Sambit, uh, Sambit Chaliha, sir. Sir. Good morning to one and all present here. Good morning, sir. It gives me immense pleasure in welcoming all of you to the handsome training program on bioinformatics organized by Institutional Biotech Hub of Bahana College. On behalf of the Bahana College, I welcome all of you. I want to convey my heartful gratitude to Pavur's Bara, resource person of this session of the training program. I'd also like to express my sincere thanks to all the participants from various parts of the country who sincerely committed to this event to make it a success. Bahana College is affiliated to Dibugar University and is located in Jurhat district of Assam. The college is near to mighty river Brahmaputra and in a rural environment. The Bahana College was established in 1966 and has 13 departments of science and arts faculties. The college has accredited A plus grade by NAC in October 2022 during the third cycle assessment. We are about 52 teachers and 13 departments. Major is offered by all departments. It has distance education programs under the Google University and KK Hendrick State Open University. The college has a good research environment with a sophisticated research laboratory in the Department of Physics, besides uh, DBT sponsored Bayatekha. Institutional Bayatekha of Bahana College organizes different activities regularly since its establishment. I am sure that uh, this training program will be profitable and fruitful for everyone present here. I welcome you all once again to the training program and hope that you all will actively participate in different technical sessions. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir, for your welcome speech and inaugurating our today's training program. Now I request our coordinator of Biotech Hub, Dr. Sangeeta Das, <coughs> to say a few words. Thank you, Zakaria. Respected uh, Principal Bahana College, Dr. Shandit Shaliha sir, respected our today's research person, Dr. Prabodh Bara sir, thank you so much sir for joining us today for this session. All other academicians, research scholars, and uh, my dear participants, and of course my project fellows, Chakaya and Mallika. Uh, Institutional Biotech Hub at the Bahana College, it was established in the year 2013, and since then, the hub is organizing different uh, activities, workshops, training programs, and other resource activities. And this uh, five-day-long training program on bioinformatics is a part of this research project, which is undergoing under the phase two biotech hub project. And uh, in this five-day-long training program, today is the first day of this uh, uh, training program. And today we're having uh, Professor Prabod Parasar. Uh, we're actually honored to have him, sir. And uh, on the day two, we will have Dr. Rohan Mashram, sir, from University of Pune. She will be talking about protein structure analysis and all. On the third day, uh, we will have Dr. Pankaj Sutla, sir, from Bibhika University, Assam. And on fourth day, uh, we will have uh, Mr. Saurav Mahanta from Bunit, Assam. And on the last day of uh, this training program, we will have Dr. Rafiul Amin Laskar sir from Department of Botany, PDUAM, Ranigul Kalimbanj, Assam. 
So I hope this uh, five-day uh, training program on bioinformatics, we will together learn about uh, different new things, new techniques, new uh, uh, you know uh, knowledge on bioinformatics. And uh, I hope uh, together we will make this program a successful one. So with this, I welcome each one of you into this five-day long training program. And I conclude here. Thank you so much. Over to Zakaria. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I request Ms. Molika Bora, uh, Lab Assistant Biotech Hub, to introduce our resource person. Mike. Good morning to all and all present here. We are honored to have the presence of Dr. Kobodja Sir, HOD, Department of Human Biotechnology, Asa Manufacturing University, who is pioneering and in fact in the field of veterinary sciences has reverberated across the field of our country. He has been Thank you, Ms. Malika Bora. Um, now I request Dr. Pobut Bora, sir, to start the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. 
phenomenon emerging out of such interaction between biomolecules. Basically, there are some important biomolecules to name the most important ones, the DNA, RNA, protein, carbohydrate, vitamins, minerals, etc. All these biomolecules interact among themselves in a, a very complex mass-like interaction involving hundreds and thousands of molecules of different nature in one particular pathway of interaction, giving rise to more structure and function in the biological system. So bioinformatics help us in analyzing the biological data and interpreting them, them to correlate the interaction between molecules and atoms to the biological activity or the functions. At the same time, to the development of different structures in the biological system. So today we shall be discussing on only one aspect of bioinformatics, that is the molecular phylogeny and phylogenetic analysis. So let me share my slides first. I hope my slides are visible to you. Yes, sir. Slides are visible. Okay. So the topic that I will be delivering today is molecular phylogeny and phylogenetic analysis. So let us know what is phylogenetics. So phylogenetics is a branch of science that deals with establishing the evolutionary relationship among different organisms. As we all know, the biological system undergoes an evolutionary process by way of mutation and selection at the level of the nucleic acids and that results in slow transformation of all living organisms giving rise to variation in characters. So within a particular species you may get a lot of variance in terms of both structural and functional characteristics. And that may be defined as strains or variants or varieties like that. But when such kind of evolutionary changes at the molecular level occurs over a period of hundreds or thousands of years, accumulating a lot of variation in the characteristics, it ultimately gives rise to a new species. And it is now assumed and accepted by the scientific community that all species on Earth have emerged by an evolutionary process because of the transformation taking place at the molecular level. The changes in the structural and functional properties occur over thousands and thousands of years, and that results in development and emergence of new species on art. So therefore, by going into the relationship between the molecular characteristics of the organisms, we can establish relation between them so as to understand the ancestral origin of a species, which species have emerged from which species, and what are the original species from which all of them emerged. So this kind of establishing relationships between species based on the molecular characteristics is referred to as phylogenetics. And a tree structure, which is referred to as phylogenetic tree. So phylogenetic tree is a way to explain the evolutionary history of today's species and to show how these species relate to each other, each other in terms of their origin or in terms of their common ancestor. Now, as we already explained, that DNA of organisms undergo a very slow process of spontaneous changes at the nucleotide level that is usually referred to as mutation. Mutation coupled with selection because of 
external environmental pressure or maybe within the biological system there are certain factors or forces that also influence on the nutritional process that results in systematic selective survival of the mutant species on earth. So the evolutionary changes in terms of nutritional selection occurring at the level of nucleic acid results in the changes in the macromolecule particularly in terms of protein sequences that results in variation in structure and function because we know that in the biological system protein is the stru structural and functional unit of life so proteins determine both the structure and the activity of living cells or living organisms. So as the nucleic acids and proteins evolved, one can establish the relationship between the different biological organisms, maybe among the different species or within species among strains, variants, varieties, etc. And this kind of analysis is known as molecular phylogenetics or simply phylogenetics. But with the advent of the whole genome sequencing platforms, when whole genome sequencing of an organism has become very rapid and robust, now people have shifted attention from using one or few genes and their sequences for establishing phylogenetic relationship to utilization of the whole genome sequence of organisms to establish the relation between them. So therefore we say that now the phylogenetics is very slowly evolving itself to phylogenomics. So there has been a migration from phylogenetics to phylogenomics in the recent So we are discussing about the phylogenetics, not the phylogenomics. So phylogenetics is still the most acceptable technique for establishing evolutionary relationship between organisms because as I already said that although phylogenomics based on the whole genome sequence is evolving, but still it is not accessible to all laboratories because it involves sophistication in the uh, infrastructure and also it involves certain cost in sequencing. So therefore, even today, the phylogenetic analysis is mostly based on certain conserved sequences in terms of nucleic acid and protein sequences of an organism. Now, there are certain advantages of using molecular data for phylogenetic analysis. Before advent of molecular phylogenetics, people used to have the analysis of relationship between species based on the empirical data that is standard, that is usually studied under conventional biology. That means they are morphological features or biochemical features at best, but not going into the depth of the cellular processes at the level of molecules or atoms. So before the advent of molecular phylogenetics, people used to have the morphological or biochemical information for classification or establishing relationship between species. But that was disadvantageous because many of the characters which are defined by the empirical characters are not discrete and they do have certain level of ambiguity. There are confusions and they cannot be limited to certain specific levels or uh, designated discrete characters. Say for example, you take the tallness of a plant or the tallness, uh, sorry, uh, the length of a leaf or breadth of a leaf or the other physical properties of a leaf of a plant. So that may be continuously variable among different species and we cannot divide the plant species into certain discrete classes 
based on such type of properties. And many times there are homages or there are similarities to the extent of near to 100%. So it is very difficult to differentiate between them based on merely morphological features. But molecular characteristics or molecular data when we use for phylogenetic analysis, they do have very specific advantages in the fact that they do have certain specific discrete properties which can be differentiated readily without any ambiguity. They are unambiguous. Say for example, the DNA sequences do have four different nucleotides, adenine, thymine, uh, then glutamine and, sorry, uh, uh, guanine and cytosine. So ATGC, adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine. So these four nucleotides constitute all forms of DNA in living things. Guanine cannot be replaced by thymine, thymine cannot be replaced by cytosine, cytosine cannot be replaced by adenine without a mutational event taking place. And when these mutational events taking place, either spontaneously or under the influence of certain environmental or intrinsic processes, they give rise to changes in the biomolecules to the extent of changes in the proteins and that results in the changes in character or changes in structure. So these molecular changes can be easily identified because these four nucleotides can be expressed by four different alphabets, A, B, G, C, and one alphabet is not confused by the other. They are quite discrete in nature. Another advantage of using molecular data is that the molecular data because they are discrete and unambiguous, can be converted to numerical form by using certain, so to say, uh, matrices or certain scale of measurement, we can convert the molecular data to numerical data. That we will discuss, we'll discuss further in the uh, next few minutes. And because of this possibility of conversion of the molecular data to numerical data easily, we can use the mathematical and statistical analytical procedures to analyze them, to calculate the differences between them or similarities between them, and therefore we can easily interpret the molecular data. So therefore, a phylogenetic analysis based on molecular data is more advantageous than that of empirical data. Although Conventionally, the DNA data or the conserved sequences of an organism are most commonly used for phylogenetic analysis, but both nucleic acid as well as protein data or sequences can be used for phylogenetic analysis. In fact, protein data is having some specific advantages over the nucleic acid data or nucleotide data for application in phylogenetic analysis. The examples of advantages include uh, the protein sequences when we align them or compare them, it gives us more information regarding the structural and functional properties which cannot be reflected by the nucleotide sequences as such because all the changes in the nucleotide sequences may not be reflected in the phenotype. But often, changes at the level of protein are reflected in the phenotype, either structurally or by making some changes in the functional properties of a living cell. <coughs> and against only four variants of nucleotides, in case of proteins, we have 20 different variants of amino acids. So that means the protein sequences can be determined by using 20 alphabets. Each of the amino acids can be represented by one alphabet and therefore the language in which the protein sequences is written or the code or signal in protein sequences is written is much more complex 
and informative than that of the nucleic acid sequences. And therefore, protein data give us more useful information of the variation among species than that of the nucleotide sequences. Another important fact regarding protein is that although the proteins consist, consist of 20 different amino acids, but many amino acids have got similar biophysical properties. And according to the biophysical properties of the amino acids, they can be classified <coughs> separately as uh, uh, positively charged amino acid, negatively charged amino acid, aromatic amino acid, aliphatic amino acid, sulfur containing amino acid, etc. So because of the similarity in terms of biophysical properties of a number of amino acids, although one amino acid is replaced by evolutionary mutation by another, always it does not give rise to any change at the phenotypic level. Because if one amino acid of a particular physicochemical or biophysical property is replaced by another of the same group having similar biophysical property, there will be no changes in the phenomenon. But when an amino acid of a particular biophysical character is changed by mutation to another amino acid of a different biophysical property, then there will be reflection of the change in the phenomenon, either in structure or in the function. So therefore, all mutational events at the level of nucleotide are not reflected in the phenomenon. But protein variations or the mutational events that result in changes in protein sequences reflect more reliable information because that can be related to the phenotypic alterations. Another important aspect of the protein sequence in relation to the nucleotide sequence is that although the nucleotide sequences
Similarly, three more codons, UAA, UAT, and UTA, these three are called as stop codons or termination codons because when the messenger RNA reaches these three codons, it does not code for these codons do not code for any amino acid and therefore the protein synthesis process gets stopped. So therefore they are called stop codons. So that means out of 64 codons, 61 codons are really coding for 20 amino acids. So from this you can easily understand that for a single amino acid there may be more than one codon. In fact, for many different amino acids, the number of codons are variable. So there are only two amino acids for which there is only a single codon. They are methionine, the, for this the codon is AUG and the other is the tryptophan for which the codon is UGG. So except these two amino acids, all other amino acids are coded by more than one codon. And in fact, they may be coded by either four codons or three codons or two codons. Basically, most of them are coded by either three, uh, two codons or four codons. Now you see, when a particular amino acid is coded by four codons, say for example in case of serine here, the codons vary, but the amino acid that they code for do not vary. UCU, UCC, UCA, and UCG. So in these four columns, the first two nucleotides are remain same. Only the third nucleotide in the column is changing. You either it is U, C, A, or G. That means even if the mutation takes place at the third codon position, third nucleotide position of the codon, the codon does not get changed because it will ultimately bring the same amino acid to the protein sequence. So ultimately it will not be affected on the phenotype. Therefore we say that the codons are degenerated. It means they one of the uh, amino acid may be coded by more than one codon and if a change of codon takes place it may not affect in the protein sequence or the amino acid sequence. So changes in the third position often do not alter the amino acid that is specified. And therefore, the protein sequences usually offer a longer look back time. That means in the evolution, the changes in the level of protein can take place over a longer duration of evolution rather than the nucleotide changes that occurs very frequently. In fact, nucleotide changes take place in bacteria very fast. That means uh, 10 to the power minus 6 to 10 to the power minus 9. That means in every uh, 1 million to 10 million cells, there can be one mutant or variant among the bacteria. Similarly, in case of a human being, it may be from 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 11. So, mutations occurring at the level of the nucleotides are more frequent and therefore it does not always provide some very, very important information at the level of the phenotype. But protein sequences provide better information in terms of changes in the phenotype, and therefore protein sequences are more reliable for biogenic analysis. DNA sequences can be converted to protein. Based on the DNA sequences, there are tools available now. Bioinformatics tools can be used to immediately translate the DNA sequences to protein. That means we can predict what amino acid sequence will be resulted from a specific gene sequence. But the reverse is not possible. From a protein sequence, you cannot go back to the nucleotide sequence. Because protein sequences might have uh, taken different codon usages. So codon uses or codon bias is another aspect to be studied. The same amino acid in a particular species may be coded more by a single codon than the other possible codons. So therefore, the species-wise also, there may be variation of the usage of different codons for amino acids. And therefore, in bioinformatics, there is another aspect of study that is 
codon uses code pattern or codon uses bias. Why is it important? Uh, let me give only one example. Say, for example, when you look for the host species of a pathogen, a pathogenic microorganism, say bacteria or virus or any parasite, usually they will observe that if the codon uses pattern in the host and the agent are similar, then there is more possibility of the pathogenicity of the particular microorganism to a particular host. So there are variations among species in terms of the preference for different and this codon usage pattern can be studied in detail and that can be one important aspect for correlating the status between the host and the parasite. So this is one example, but codon usage bias is also important for studying evolutionary relationship as well as the evolutionary history of organisms. Now, there are of course certain disadvantages too in case of protein sequences if we use only. So proteins could be under evolutionary pressure. So the protein sequences may undergo variation even after sequence is determined by gene sequences because of certain evolutionary pressure either offered intrinsically within the biological system or maybe extrinsically which is due to certain environmental factors maybe physical or chemical or any other environmental factor so therefore they may sometimes give us some erroneous or uh, misleading information also if we only take into account the protein sequences without considering the nuclear sequences Similarly, if we use the only protein data, then we will not be able to uh, that means, uh, give importance to the real medicinal events taking place at the level of the nucleotide. We will be skipping some of the evolutionary events. There are certain known problems in sequence data which causes difficulty in using molecular data for paragenetic analysis. So, the, our interpretation of relationship between species is basically based on the comparative assessment of the similarity or distance or variation among the sequences, either nucleotide sequences or amylosin sequences. So, by way of doing sequence alignment. So, sequence alignment is again a uh, bioinformatics process which can be done by different online and offline tools. I'll not discuss in detail, but I'll show you in some in the next slide uh, how the alignment is done and how the scoring is done, how the variation between sequences can be converted to numerical value. So some, uh, in case of most of the sequence alignment programs, usually we do not consider the variation that may be inherent to a species so there will be the rate of evolution or mutation occurring at different positions in the same sequence at different levels. So within a single genome of a particular organism, in different genes, the rate of mutation may be different. Similarly, the rate of mutation among species may also differ. So normally, if the sequence alignment tool that they were using fail to detect or consider this kind of variation in the evolutionary rate among species or within a species in different positions of the nuclear sequence, then it becomes difficult to correlate the interpretation to the real prototyping situation. So there are a number of different methods used for paragenetic analysis. Most commonly, four different methods are used. The methods are maximum parsimony, neighbor joining method, UPGMA method, and maximum likelihood method. These are the four 
commonly used methods, but of course, in addition to that, there are one or two more methods. We will not be focusing on that. These are the four commonly used methods. Maximum parsimony, neighbor joining, UPGMA, and maximum likelihood. Now, out of these four methods, UPGMA and neighbor joining method, these two have got high level of similarity in terms of approach and the techno technique and therefore they are called distance method or distance matrix method. Same principle is adopted in both but the calculation is in, done in one by applying statistical procedure and the other by using mathematical models and therefore they are combined called as distance method or distance matrix method. Now, based on the type of data that they are analyzing and based on the, uh, the similarities or differences among them, we need to decide which method has to be used. So this is a very critical situation. Uh, for a novice, it becomes very difficult to decide which method is to be used for a particular arithmetic analysis. We need to know the principle based on which the selection of method can be done. So for doing any phylogenetic analysis, first of all, we need to have a set of related sequences. And as I say, these sequences may be either nucleotide sequences or protein sequences or both. So among the nucleotide sequences, most commonly in case of bacteria, the conserved sequences of 16S ribosomal RNA are taken for phylogenetic analysis. So 16S ribosomal RNA or you can refer to as 16S ribosomal DNA because it is found in the bacteria in terms of DNA only that determines the 16S ribosomal RNA. So ribosomal RNA it means it is a type of small RNA which is a constituent part of the ribosomes. Now, these are also coded by genes, although originally people thought that genes only code for proteins, but genes also code for ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA. So 16S ribosomal RNAs are coded by 16S ribosomal DNA that is present within the bacterial chromosome. So that part is highly conserved. What is this conserved? Means they are undergoing mutation. But within a species, they are highly conserved. Means when they undergo significant changes, they give rise to new species. Within a species, variation in 16S ribosomal RNA is very minimal and they are highly identical to the extent of 99%, 100% identity will be there. So that means they do not change to a great extent within a species, among the different members of a the species. Therefore, they are called conserved sequences. And if we use these conserved sequences for phylogenetic analysis, then we can correlate the variation among the species. Similarly, in case of eukaryotes, like plants or animals, instead of the RNA, we used to have the mitochondrial DNA as the conserved sequences for phylogenetic analysis. As you know, Mitochondria also has got nucleicacy in the form of DNA. And mitochondria itself may have hundreds of different genes in it. And there are certain important genes in mitochondria which regulate the oxidative phosphorylation process or the respiratory process. And they are metabolically very, very important. And that is why you know that mitochondria is universally referred to as the powerhouse of the cell. They are metabolic. They are, uh, the, the, there is presence of genes which code for important metabolic enzymes. So the mitochondria is of maternal origin. So the heredity pattern followed by mitochondria is only the maternal heredity. That means when the zygote is formed, by union between the male sperm with the female ovum, the male sperm do not contribute the mitochondria to the zygote. 
That means the zygote present in the final uh, embryo, uh, the, the zygote will have only the mitochondria derived from the mother cell, from the ova. There is no contribution of the sperm cell. And therefore, the mitochondria usually carries the genetic information from one generation to the other without having any change. There is no mixing or there is no any reconstitution of the gene by mixing the genetic elements from the sperm and the ova, other and the mother. And therefore, the mitochondrial genes are considered as highly conserved in eukaryotes and they are usually used for parasitic analysis. So first of all, we have to go for a multiple sequence alignment. That means we will have to analyze the similarities and differences between the sequences and we will have to quantify or numerically express the percentage of similarity or percentage of differences between the sequences. When we see those and align the sequences, then we have to ask the question, is there a strong sequence similarity? If the answer to this query is yes, then we will use the method called maximum parsimony. If there are large scale similarity between the sequences, then we will use the phylogenetic analysis tool that is called maximum parsimony. Then if the answer to this question is no, there is no strong sequence similarity, then we ask another question. Is there clearly recognizable sequence similarity? Okay, large scale similarity does not exist. But whether there are certain similarity at the level of certain segments, so segmental similarity is also important. There may not be overall similarity in the sequence in the entire length. But if there are certain parts of the sequence where we have observed some similarity among the sequences in the set of sequences that we have used, then our choice will be distance matrix method. That means either neighbor joining method or EPG method. Then if the answer to our query is again no, that means there is no segmental similarity also. There is much difference between the sequences. In that case, we will use the process called maximum likelihood. Then after using these three methods, we will do the analysis. And then we will further do a process of analyzing the derived result out of the parasitic analysis by a statistical procedure so that we can repeat the process hundreds of times and see if after every time we are getting the same result or not. Out of 100 times, how many times we are getting the same result. So I will come to that. So that method is called the validation. So validation can be done by a number of methods. <coughs> One of the most uh, commonly used methods is called bootstrap method. So bootstrapping is a statistical method of validation of phylogenetic tree. So that will be done after we do the analysis and derive the tree built based on the phylogenetic analysis using one of the three methods. <coughs> Maximum parsimony, distance matrix method, and maximum likelihood, they are more commonly used than other methods which are uh, not popular. So we will be discussing only these three methods today. So let me explain a little bit. Any problem? So let me explain a little bit how the sequences are compared and how the differences or the similarity between the sequences can be quantified or converted to a numerical figure. For example, suppose we are to align or compare two sequences, sequence 1 and sequence 2, as it is shown here. 
sequence 1 and sequence 2. So these three sequence, sequences, before putting these gap or the dash, these dash were put by me later on. So it, I, originally, I excuse me, is there an issue? Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. You are good. Can you request the participants to mute their microphone? Yeah. All, the, all the participants kindly mute your microphone so that there are no disturbances coming. Thank you very much for your present hearing. So, kindly mute your microphone. Okay. Uh, when we consider the original sequences without these gaps or dashes, then you see, when we align them or trying to compare them nucleotide-wise from first nucleotide onwards, we see that for the first few nucleotides, there are certain similarities. The perpendicular lines are drawn wherever there is identical duplicacy. That means the perpendicular lines represent identity in nucleotide sequence. So, these sequences are similar, but there are certain nucleotides which are different. T here, in the other one is A. But here again, A in the other sequence is Z. So these variations, T replaced by A or A replaced by Z, can be explained by us in terms of the evolutionary mutation. So these variations have occurred because of Point mutation. I think you know that there are two types of mutation. One is called point mutation and the other is called frame shift mutation or insertion deletion mutation. In the point mutation, there is a replacement, replacement of one nucleotide by another nucleotide. But in case of frame shift mutation, there are either insertion or deletion of nucleotides. So this can be explained by a point mutation. But when we do not put this gap here, if C would have been here in the original sequence, then there would have been no similarity between C and T, then A and C, then G and A, then T and G, then T and T, like that. So in many nucleotides, there would not have been any similarity. But after we put this gap here, we found that six nucleotides thereafter were similar to each other. That means they are completely identical. That means, what does it mean? That means these two sequences might have been of the same origin, but they have variated or they have become different from each other because of mutational changes. Here, a mutation took place in, in the form of replacement of T by A, here A by Z, and here there is another friendship mutation that is either there is a deletion of T from the first one or there is an insertion of T in the second. So, therefore, we can rearrange the sequences by putting gaps here and there, here and there. First, first time we will put it arbitrarily here and there. And after every time we will see that whether after putting the gap, the similarities or identities are increasing. If identities are not increasing after putting a gap, there is no question of putting a gap. But if we put a gap and see that the identities created by alignment are more, that means score will be more, score of similarity will be more, then we will put these gaps. So this is one way how we use the bioinformatics alignment tools for determining the variation between sequences. Because if we do not put these gaps, then we will not consider the evolutionary mutational events taking place which have really deviated the sequences from each other. Actually, these sequences might have been originating from the same sequence at some time in the evolution. But because of either point mutation or friendship mutation, they have migrated from each other 
and these kind of variations have resulted. So after arranging and aligning them by putting these gaps, by maximizing the identities, we will say that this is the final alignment of the two sequences. Now we are using short sequences, that is why I could do it manually. But when we consider millions of sequences present in the genome of an organism, if we want to compare genome of one organism with another, you will understand clearly that it will not be possible to do this alignment by manual process. It is not possible. So therefore, certain dy dynamic algorithms are used in the bioinformatics softwares to do this alignment and then score the distances or similarities between sequences. Now let me explain a little bit how the distances or the similarities can be numerically expressed. So for example, in this alignment, if we want to go for measuring the distance between the two sequences or difference between the two sequences, then any mass in the nucleotide should be considered to have zero score because there is no distance or no difference. As there is no difference, so distance score will be zero. But when there is a mismatch or when there is substitution or replacement, that means one nucleotide is replaced by another, like this, T replaced by A, it is called substitution or replacement. So in that case, there is a variation, some distance has arisen. So therefore, the distance score, let us take it as one. Suppose we are taking one as the score for substitution. Then when there is insertion or deletion, it represents a frame shift mutation. So frame shift mutations are usually lesser in frequency than that of point mutation. Point mutation usually occur at a very rapid rate compared to insertion deletion or frame shift mutation. Therefore, insertion deletion mutation represents more variation within the uh, between the sequences, and therefore distance score should be considered as more. Suppose we consider the insertion deletion score is 2. If we take, take this matrix or a scale of measurement for determining the distance between sequence 1 and 2, then how will you calculate it? First of all, we will calculate the matrices, but matrices have got no score for distance, therefore it is irrelevant to us. We will not go for counting the matrices. We will count the substitution because that has a better score. How many substitutions are here? One, two, three, four. There are four substitutions. So for four substitutions, the score will be four into one is equal to four. Then how many insertion deletions are there? One, two, three, four, five. There are five insertion deletions. Each insertion deletion represents two. So two into five, ten. That means distance score will be 10. So total distance score between these two sequences is 14. Okay? So that's how we convert it into numerical figure. Distance score will be 14. Or you can convert it to even the percentage. If you count the number of nucleotides, suppose there are uh, 30 nucleotides, the distance score in terms of percentage will be 14 divided by 30, 13, uh, 14 divided by 30, multiplied by 100. So that will be in percentage. Similarly, in a reverse way, if we consider the similarity between the sequences, if we want to express the similarity percentage or similarity uh, between the two sequences in terms of numerical value, then we have to consider the matrices, means identities as similar, similarities. They are highly similar, that is why they are matched. So the score will be one. For substitution, there is no similarity, so score will be zero. For insertion deletion, there is no disparity or dissimilarity between them. There is no similarity at all. So let us give a minus score, minus 1.5. If we take this particular scale of measurement of similarity, then if we count the similarity, 
between these two sequences, what will you find? Already you calculated the number of substitution. There were four. It will be zero. Then there will be five inserts in deletion. It will be 1.5 into 5 minus figure will be minus 1.5 into 5 is equal to minus 7.5. Then how many similarities are there? Each perpendicular line represents one similarity or identity. 4, 6, 9, 15, 21, 24. Total 24 similarities or matches. So total score will be 14. 14 minus 7.5 is equal to 16.5. So similarity score will be 16.5. That means we can express both the way. Either we can say distance score between the two sequences is 14 or similarity score between the two sequences is 16.5. But for that we are to use a specific scale of measurement or a matrix. So this is a very, very simple matrix I have shown. But in fact the matrices that are designed for sequence alignment are little complex and variable. Uh, for doing that in the dynamic platform by using computational method, two specific substitution matrices were developed. One in 1978 by uh, Dayhoff, Day and in 1992 another by Hennikoff and Hennikoff. And these two are most commonly used PAM and GOSA. So, this is one particular scoring matrix for protein sequences, protein sequence alignment, PAM 250. It's a complex scoring matrix. That means it is showing the scores for replacement of one particular amino acid by the other. Okay? When cysteine is replaced by phenylalanine, the score is 70. That means it is usually a very rare event in the biological system and therefore the score is high. So when there is uh, the frequency of the evolutionary process occurring is considered and that is converted to the score relevant to the replacement or substitution of one amino acid to the other, it gives a very complex picture. And there has been converted to a matrix by Dayhoff and this is known as PAM250. In fact, there are many variants of the PAM matrix, PAM150, PAM250, PAM500, PAM etc. Similarly, there are GOSA matrices also. I will not go into detail about that, but you should know that different kinds of scaling indexes or matrices are used for measuring the distance or similarity between sequences. Now in distance matrix method, as I said that there are two methods commonly used, UPZM, that is unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean, and neighbor joining method. These two methods are commonly used. And, but there is another third method called Kitchen Margulias method, which is less commonly used. We will be discussing about the first two. Let us consider the UPZM method. This is the oldest and simplest method. So this is a statistically based method. So UPCMA stands for unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean. So that means it uses the arithmetic mean as the method of measurement. So let me explain it a little bit so that you can understand how based on this analysis we can have the drawing of the arithmetic tree. Suppose we have got four sequences. These alphabets, capital alphabets represent one sequence. Suppose there are four sequences A, B, C, and D. And after doing the alignment, multiple sequence alignment between them, we found that the difference or distance between A and B is 4, distance between B and C is 9, distance between B and D is 20, distance between B and C is 7. Distance between C and D is 17, and distance between B and D is 80. So I have noted this according to the distance between each of the pairs of the sequences. Now, to draw the tree based on these data that we have derived from alignment by scoring them, scoring the distances, now we will have to use the UPGA method. In the UPGA method, as I said that, 
or focus is on determining the arithmetic mean. That means mean distance between two sequences. So first of all, we will select the sequences between which there is the least variation. So least distance or the smallest figure among these distances is 4. So there is a least distance between A and B. So we will take this pair first. Okay? So difference between or distance between A and B will be calculated as an average or arithmetic mean. Total distance is 4. So average distance is 2. That we have calculated. So what will you do? Now we will draw a line of 2 unit length both from A and B. Perpendicular line, we will place A and B side by side, keeping a distance. Then we will draw two perpendicular lines of same length, two unit. This unit may be inches, it unit may be centimeter, it may be millimeter, whatever it is, but it should be same unit. So same length, we have drawn two perpendicular lines and join them with a horizontal line. Okay? So these perpendicular lines will indicate the distance between A and B. Then we go back to the next pair. So first pair we have calculated distance. Then now we will be taking A and B combined together as a single entity, composite group, A plus B as a composite group. Then we will find the distance from others. So when you calculate different distance between A, B and C, that means A, B taken as single group from C, which will what well, calculate the distance, it will be distance of A from C plus distance of B from C divided by 2, average distance. So distance of A from C is equal to 7, distance of B from C is equal to, oh, sorry, A from C is equal to 9 and B from C is equal to 7. So 9 plus 7 divided by 2 is equal to 16 by 2 is equal to 8. So that means distance of A and B from C is 8. So what we will do, we will take at the same distance another figure C and from C we will draw a perpendicular line of the length of 4 unit. Same unit we will take, whether it is inches or centimeter or millimeter. So 4 unit length perpendicular we will draw. Then we will use one, another perpendicular line from the center of the previous horizontal line and then we will extend it to 4 unit and join them by a horizontal line like this. This will indicate that the distance of A and B together from C is 4 unit. Okay? So that means distance 4 is 4. It is represented by this figure. Then similarly distance of AB from D will be is equal to distance from distance of A from D plus distance of B from D divided by 2, when it calculated, it will be, it will be 19. So after doing this, we will make another, that means matrices available to us, taking A, B as 1, <coughs> distance is 8 from, uh, uh, that is A, B from C is equal to 8, A, B from D is equal to 19, then we will go for calculation of the average distance. As I say, from AB to C, we have calculated this 4 as I have already explained to you. That is why we have drawn a line of 4 unit. Similarly, when you consider the distance from C to D, then ABC will be considered as one single unit and we will calculate the distance from D. ABC taken as one unit from D, when you calculate, then it will be distance of AB from D plus distance of CB from C from D divided by 2 is equal to 18. So average distance of ABC from D is equal to 18 divided by 2 is equal to 9. So from, we will write D here and draw another perpendicular line of 9 unit and join as done previously. So this will be the final algorithmic tree constructed by UPGMA process for representing the evolutionary distance between A, B, C, and D. Now from this figure, we can easily understand that A and B are more closely related to each other in the evolutionary history. That means 
for A and B, there is a common ancestor C. A and B both have emerged out of C. It is the common ancestor. And all these A, B, and C, the common ancestor, ancestor was D. But they have traveled a long distance. Means in the evolution, it took long thousands of years to derive C and then from C to D and A. So the variation between the species or the relationship can be drawn by this kind of congenetic tree very vividly so that we can understand the evolutionary origin of a species. In the neighbor learning method, instead of using the common arithmetic mean, <coughs> least square distance matrix method is used. It is again a statistical method and it usually joins the neighbors one after the other. First of all, it also determines the pair of sequences which has got least distance and then one by one the next sequence having lesser distance value will be joined together. So like this. So, a and B are closest together, then C, then D, then, then E. So like this way, the tree is built. That is why it is called neighbor joining method. Now, as I refer to bootstrapping, what is bootstrapping? Bootstrapping, as I already said, is a statistical method of validation of the tree. Once we draw, uh, draw the tree, we have to test its reliability. For that, what do we do? We use various methods, but uh, bootstrapping is the common method, in which the sequences are picked up out of the set of sequences in different groups 500 to 1000 times. Say, for example, we have got 10 sequences. Sometimes you will take 9 sequences, sometimes you will take 8 sequences, sometimes you will take all 10 sequences, sometimes you will take 5 sequences like that. So we will repeat the process of drawing the algebraic tree by using the same method over and around 500 to 1000 times. And we will see whether a particular branch in the tree is appearing in the same place or not. That means out of 100 times the tree is built repeatedly, how many times a particular branch is appearing at the same place? Or position. So that is called bootstrap score. So percentage of time in which a branch of the tree appears at the same position. So that gives a reliability. If the percentage of bootstrap value is more than 70%, it is usually considered as highly acceptable or highly reliable. But of course, in most of the cases, value if the sequences are very short. Longer the sequences, better is the parametric analysis and better acceptable to there in terms of bootstrapping value. That is why, as I said, that instead of focusing on one or two gene sequences, now the whole genome sequence is taken for parametric analysis, which is more reliable than that of the parametric analysis based on one or two control sequences. Now, there are different types of trees which can be built. Say for example, it can be a rooted tree or it can be unrooted tree. A rooted tree means the tree depicts the ancestor or the root or origin of branches. These are the terminology which are usually used in parametric analysis. Leaves or leaf, a leaf is the terminal component. Okay, that means it is the sequence or the species which is the terminal component of the tree. Okay? So this is called leaf. So if in a particular figure, if you find that two leaves are closely related to each other and making this kind of figure, this is called a clad. C-L-A-T-E. Clad. And the clad is having a common origin. Okay? It's a branch point. The origin is connected to the branches with the help of the branch point, the middle midpoint of the branch. So these are the branches. These branches are joined from the branch point to the root. So root is the ancestor. 
So when the figure contains the root, it is called a rooted tree. And it can be either scaled or unscaled. That means you can draw these lines keeping the distance score intact in terms of the unit length. Then it is called a scaled tree. But if we do not keep it intact as per the scoring that we obtain, then it is called an unscaled tree. Only the relation is shown, but the real distance is not maintained. Then in that case, it is called unscaled tree. That means there will be different combinations of trees. Maybe rooted scale tree or unrooted scale tree. Then scaled rooted tree or unscaled rooted tree, like that. Or unscaled unrooted tree. There are different combinations can be there. So here suppose we are determining the relationship between three species, human, mouse and fly. After doing the analysis based on certain conjunct sequences, suppose mitochondrial DNA, we would find that human and mice, mouse have formed one clan. This is a clan. And fly is another leaf which itself is considering one clan. This is separated from this clan. So fly itself is making a clan quite away from the human and mouse. And if we have a branch tree rooting, uh, showing the root, then we can say that at some time in the evolution, human, mouse and fly might have originated from the same root, but it is very distant from the present evolutionary, so to say, status of the tree species. So here, in this particular diagram or biogenic analysis, we have used fly intentionally because we know that the distance between human and mouse is very less compared to the distance from fly. So in any phylogenetic analysis, normally we take one or more such elements or sequences which are apparently different from others. Normally we do the phylogenetic analysis between a set of similar sequences. Because if they are apparently dissimilar, uh, there is no question of phylogenetic analysis. We can immediately say that they are variant from each other. So when we take into account the variation between similar sequences, then in the group we usually take another sequence which is apparently dissimilar. That is usually referred to as an outgroup or outlier. Outgroup or outlier. So that is usually taken as an internal control as you do in any experiment as a control, a positive control. This is the positive control. That means we know that that is quite variable from the others. So this fly should not be a part of the clad in which the human and mouse are placed. So if fly is placed in the same clad as that of human and mouse after analysis, we will know that maybe our data is insufficient or maybe there was something wrong in doing the cardiac analysis. So that is why always in terms of present analysis, we keep one outlier or outgroup, apparently dissimilar to others. So these are some of the, so to say, uh, way how the glossaries are used in phylogenetic tree. Okay? These are terminologies which are used. A node is a taxonomic unit. This can be either an existing species or an ancestor. A branch defines the relationship between the taxa in terms of descent and ancestry. Like that, the entire uh, glossary pattern I have listed here, I have already explained to you in terms of the diagram. So these are the different types of trees that can be built. It is an unrooted scale tree. So both rooted and unrooted trees can be either bifurcating or multifurcating. So it can bifurcate or multifurcate. And therefore, there are many possible ways of having the arithmetic tree. So scaled branches, uh, scaled rooted tree, scaled unrooted tree, bifurcated tree, and uh, say it can also be presented in different way, either in the rectangular form or in the triangular form. This is the triangular form, this is the rectangular form. Rectangular form is very commonly used, or a radiant form can also be used. Sometimes it can be also expressed in circular form. According to your choice or necessity, 
you can choose in what way the figures or the uh, diagrams will be represented. Here, suppose it is an angular tree, it is showing the relationship between four humanoid apps. As you know, we have four different humanoid apps, chin, chimpanzee, gorilla, orangutan, and of course, uh, the gibbon is also there. Gibbon, we have not included here. So three humanoid apps have been used to show the relationship between human based on the whole genome sequence. And here, baboon we have kept as an outlier or outgroup because baboon is not a humanoid app. It is quite variant from the chimpanzee, gorilla, orangutan, and human. When we go for doing analysis, we could see that human beings have got closest similarity to chimpanzee. That means chimpanzee was the immediate ancestor of human being. Human being had evolved probably in the evolutionary history from chimpanzee. So at the level of the genomic sequence, we have got 98.7% similarity. Human beings and chimpanzee have got 98.7% similarity in terms of whole genome sequence. But that 1.3% variation makes the difference between the species chimpanzee and human. There is a rather high difference. So for any phylogenetic analysis, what are the requirements? First of all, we have to have, have a set of related sequences, either replicacy or protein. As I say, conserved sequences are usually better. In terms of replicacy, they are 16 established on RNA sequences or microbial sequences in case of the uh, eukaryotic species. Then in case of protein, most commonly the ribosomal proteins are taken because ribosomal proteins are highly conserved to the species. There are more than 40 ribosomal proteins present all or some of them can be taken for this purpose. If you take it, take it to account, you could achieve it. Then you have to have multiple alignment software with you, either Trustel X or Trustel W or Muscle or any other software which can do the alignment for you. Or you can use then one phylogenetic analysis tool. Um, we will be using in our case the Mega. Mega is a dynamic platform for using both alignment as well as phylogenetic analysis. We will not use two different softwares, we will use a single software. Mega is a dynamic platform available free of cost to you. You can download it from the website. And uh, there has been regular upgradation. Now the 11th version is in use. So I have already saturated the 11th version, the software to you through your coordinator and she will distribute to you before the practical class. You please uh, download the, sequel, uh, the software and also you install the software by clicking on the link. And I have also given you one uh, set of sequence of COX-1 gene of different mammalian species. COX-1 gene is the uh, saturated uh, oxidase enzyme coding gene that is present in the mitochondria of different different mammalian species. session uh, uh, and we have learned uh, uh, about uh, using of uh, molecular uh, data using of uh, uh, protein sequence and DNA and differences of uh, uh, phylogenetic uh, differences of DNA and protein sequences uh, I hope our participant will benefit it, uh, from this uh, session now I like uh, Miss Molika Bora Oh no, 
sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, now it's uh, time for interactive interactive session. Sir, are you okay with the interactive session uh, in this session? Or yes, yes. Okay. You can ask it now, or you may be asking it after the practical session also, because it will be more clear when we deal with the practical part. Yes. So I request all of you to be with your computer or laptop before you, so that you can follow me step by step. Because I'll be doing the practicals online, and you can follow me step by step. If you download the Meta Eleven software and the sequences that I have. Yes, sir. And we'll and provide the. Uh, Sir, we will provide the drive link to everyone uh, in their respective mail for their software. Even then, if someone is having specific uh, question, you may raise it. I'll be happy to answer. Anyone have yeah. any queries? Yes, sir. You can ask or write on the chat box. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, There are no queries. Okay, okay fine. Okay, sir. Please proceed. Uh, now I request Ms. Malika Bora uh, Bahana College Bahana. 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 to end the meeting with a formal vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Now our first round is ended, and the second session will start from 1:30 p.m. onwards. Thank you. We hope see all of you at 1:30 p.m. Please join us at 1:30 p.m. So bye bye for now. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you, sir. Namaskar. 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 Namask